You're attacking wrong in Rainbow Six Siege, so in today's video I'll be giving you 17 tips to attack better. For the first tip, you should be opening as many angles as possible. To show you this, I've brought you on to Chalet, which is a great example of what I'm about to be talking about. If you're ever doing a library take, where you rappel onto library, you open up the double window, and you try to take Mez, you shouldn't just do that. First, you want to honestly open up the games window here. Then honestly, I would open the mud window as well. You can rappel here and open up the bathroom window with a gone six. And just by doing that, you've made it a lot more dangerous for anybody to try to contest you. You opening this bathroom window made it to where they're not going to rotate through there as easily, and you might be able to get a cheeky kill on that rappel. Opening this games window makes it to where if there's anybody playing below the hatch while you're rappelled, it's a lot more dangerous for them to do that, so they're just, just adding ghost pressure. And then by opening this window here, you're making it to where they know you're pushing library. By opening the mud window, you make it to where they can't just sit bottom blue stairs. So you're, you're, you're making it a lot more dangerous for people to sit in places, even if you're not really there, because you're applying a ghost pressure, which is something you can do very, very easily on attack that I thought that I should briefly mention in this video. Another thing you need to start doing on attack is upside down repelling more. If you're not good at taking gunfights upside down repelled, you definitely should start training that as it's going to become very useful. Now let's pretend that this zero camera here is the head of a player, while this zero camera here is the feet of a player. If I'm upside down repelled, I am easily able to see the feet, the legs, and even the hips and torso of a player, but because their head is all the way up there, they will not be able to see me. If you don't know how perspective works in Siege, the camera is right between a player's eyes. So if that camera can't see me, but I can still see them, that means I'm able to shoot them and get information on them very, very easily and get a free kill where they're not even able to shoot or see me at all. So if you're on attack, upside down repel on all the windows you try to repel on to make it a lot easier for you to take gunfights in these certain scenarios. Moving on to my third attacker tip, let's get off the repel and get on the drone. Because as an attacker, a mistake that I see players making is they're way too afraid to actually start droning. Whether it be they're under droning because they're not droning themselves in the building and they're just sitting outside all around, or they're actually going in the building but they're not droning themselves in and they're dying. So make sure that you're actually droning in whenever you're going into the building, but also on attack, never be afraid to dr drone in general. It could be like a minute into the round. If you've gotten your entry picks and you just need to start getting utility on the board, you don't know where anybody is, you have no information, you don't know how to execute, then start droning. Never be afraid to drone on attack and start droning more unless you're over droning, which is a completely separate issue. But especially in, in a more aggressive season and an aggressive year, people just aren't droning as much. So you need to make sure that you are. And even droning in your teammates as well can be something that is very, very helpful helpful to either win or lose your ranked games. Something else that can win or lose you a ranked game is learning to slow down on attack. Now I get attack means you're actually attacking. You have to go to them, which means you don't really have the luxury of just sitting back and not doing anything. But it also doesn't mean that you have to rush people. You don't have to play aggressive all the time. You don't have to run into the bomb site. There are chances and opportunities when you should be slowing down, when you should start to use utility, when you should start to get information, start to drone like I just talked about earlier. But when is that opportunity? You want to be doing this after you've gotten your entry frags. Now entry fragging, whether it be you got a kill pretty late into the round, you've got to kill early in the round, you've taken space, it doesn't matter. Once you've gotten those first few picks and you've gotten a little bit of space near the bombsite, now you need to drone out the bombsite. You need to drone out the remaining defenders. You need to make sure that you know where all the utility is so you don't die to a cap can trap, so you don't die to a guy sitting in a corner with a shotgun. This is where you would drone the most. You drone in your entries if you're a support player, you drone in the prep phase but not into the bombsite, and then you also make sure that you're droning in whenever you're trying to actually execute onto the bombsite after you've gotten your entry picks. That's when you'd slow down, you'd play more passive, you'd hold angles, and you drone, you get information. But also, you need to learn when to be aggressive, right? If you're aggressive on attack, that typically happens within the first 30 seconds of the round, because you need to enter the building, you need to get entry picks. Also, if you're in a post-plant situation, you'd play passive then too, right? So, this all fits into this tip of learning when to slow down on attack. Really, there's only two scenarios. You slow down after you get your entry picks, and you slow down in a post-plant, or whenever you don't have information and you need to drone somebody. But you won't be able to actually slow down and drone people if you don't have drones in the first place. Which brings me into my fifth tip. You need to be saving your prep phase drones. Too often am I seeing people just driving their drones into sight just to get information on people and their drones dying. Now I understand this might seem like a good idea if you have a Deimos on your team and you need to red ping people, which is like the one rare exception. And I can also understand if you're playing Yana and you have clones so you can afford to waste a drone or two. But beyond that, you really should be saving your drone. It's cool to be able to get the information on what their site setup is, what operators are playing, what site they are in general. But if you're in high enough elo and you're average at the game, you've played the game, you know the maps, you know most of the operators, you can kind of guess what they're going to run based off of bands, based off of you hearing what guns they're running. Like if I hear a vector, I know they're either playing Goyo or Mira. 
but if it's Paceman Oregon, it's probably a Mira, right? So you don't have to actually drive your drone into sight to see what they're doing. Chances are, if you're solo queuing as well, your teammates are also driving their drones into sight, so you can just get on their drone and get the information that you need. But if you don't have drones that you can use because you wasted one in the prep phase and one early in the round, it's going to really, really haunt you later in the round when we talked about how you need to be droning in my previous tip. So make sure that you don't run your drone into prep phase and waste it for absolutely zero reason, and use sound calls, get on your teammates' drones, and save that drone for later in the round. Something else that I see people doing on attack that is terribly wrong is they're prioritizing getting kills over getting the plant down. Now, there are scenarios in which both of these are going to be the correct move. If you're in a 1v1 situation and the person's close to you, you don't really have cover to plant behind, then sure, go for the kill. If you know you have information on that person and they don't have information on you or you can pre-fire them or it's just an easy kill and you know it is, then of course, go for the kill. But if you have the clock on your side, you have utility, maybe you're up in man count, you have the sight, don't go for kills, get the plant down if it's safe to do so. And a lot of the times, it is honestly safe to do so. You can at least try to get the plant down, and if he tries to rush you, then go for the kill. Or if there's barely any time left, that's when you'd go for the kill, because then he's just going to wait for you to plant, wait for the time to run out, and then kill you, right? So there are certain scenarios where you should go for the kill, but on attack in general, you should really, really be prioritizing plants. This is due to the fact that when you get the bomb down, now the roles are reversed. Defenders have to come to you while you defend the bomb, instead of you going to the defenders and them defending the bomb. This makes makes it to where you can play passive, you can hold angles, and if you've ever played Siege, you know that Siege is a defender-sided game because of these simple principles. If you're holding angles with a gun in a game with servers, it's going to be a lot better because of defense and a lot easier for you to win than it is on attack, which is why going for bombs and playing a post-plant scenario naturally is just going to be easier for you, especially if you know how to do it by fake running up to people who are defusing or things of that nature. So always prioritize going for plants if you have the safe option to do so, and never really go for kills because you're taking unnecessary gunfights that you don't really know if you're going to win. Something else that is completely unnecessary is wasting more than one flash grenade on one person. Think of one flash grenade as one room that you're able to clear. I love using flash grenades as room clearing instead of getting kills, but either or are acceptable. To show this to you, I'm going to bring you in-game really quickly. For this example, let's say that the bomb site is in gym or master, or at least that's what I'm trying to roam clear for maybe the basement site. You get the idea. There's just somebody here that I'm trying to clear out and I have flash grenades. If I know that there is a kid in this corner or at least in this room, I don't need to waste one flash grenade and then two flash grenades. It's not like it's going to double blind them or blind them for two times the duration. I can just lob one frag grenade or flash grenade, I guess, over here flash the person and that's enough to blind them to be able to swing and make sure that you've taken the space or gotten the kill if i want to take master and i've quick peek this and i know no one's close and i know no one's in the bathroom but i hear someone on my hard right or i'm just trying to clear the room i don't need to waste two flash grenades i can throw one into the room right here wait for the flash to go off run in and take the space and you should be utilizing every single flash grenade like this you don't want to lob a bunch in you typically don't want to waste it on things like ads's or rooney gates unless you need to you want to be using each flash grenade as a way to take space, especially if you know someone is there, to be able to roam clear even more efficiently than you had before. It's really good on operators like Dokubi where you can call and figure out where they are, and once you hear, hey, they're around the corner because their phone is ringing, you just flash in and you go and get the kill. So use one flash grenade to clear one room or to get one kill, and don't waste any more than that, and you'll be way more efficient with this piece of utility. Something else that is way more efficient is playing off of your teammates who are entering. This is called being a secondary entry fragger, or you can even do this as a flex or a support operator. If you notice that you have one teammate who you can actually trust that has good gun skill to run in, actually baiting them is not a bad idea. There is a fine line between a good baiting and bad baiting, but usually if you know that your teammate is going to get an entry frag pick, whether you're roam clearing or executing on the site, making sure that you're playing off of him, especially in 2vx scenarios on attack, is crucial because then if he dies, you're able to refrag him. Or if there's two enemies, he kills one and the other one's there, you can then get that kill. But if you're leaving your teammate in a 1v1 and then you're leaving yourself in a 1v1, it is much more likely that you win a 1v1 than a 2v1. So making sure that you're actually playing off of your teammates and you're taking those trades is crucial if you see somebody that's trying to roam clear every round by themselves, which you will see a lot in solo queue environments because if you're solo queuing, chances are your teammates probably aren't in the stack either, obviously, because they can't be because you're in their team. You get the idea, whatever. But the point of it being is that you want to be refragging your teammates. So if you see that there's a teammate who's alone, 
go with him. Or if you see that your teammates are rushing the site, maybe three or four teammates are running Finca Blitz, Monty Smokes, whatever it may be, you see they're rushing the site, you might be like good spirited by trying to get a hatch open, but it's not going to help them. What will help them is playing with them or playing off of them. So if their dumb strat doesn't work, you can at least refrag them and put the man count back in the balance to be able to play the round how you want to play it and be able to actually win the round instead of just hoping that your teammates do good because where I'm from, that don't happen often. <laughs> Let me tell you what, that does not happen often. So just play for team, bait them if you can to a certain degree so that you can win more rounds on attack. And this plays into my next point, which is never roam clear alone. Instead of being the person to help your roam clear, we're going to put you in the shoes of somebody who's trying to roam clear alone. And now, if you don't have somebody that's being a good teammate that is refragging off of you, don't roam clear alone. It doesn't make any sense. If you're going to go for a roam clear, that typically means you're either hitting the backside or you're playing vert. And if you're going to do that, you can't just do it with one person. Otherwise, you're taking way too risky of gunfights. Like I said earlier, if someone's roaming, typically they have a second roamer. And taking a 2v1 is a lot harder than taking a 2v2 or a 3v2, right? So if you're going to roam clear, make sure you have a teammate, maybe communicate to your team. Hey, can I get someone to help me on the roam clear? Or if you see someone is playing vert, then maybe go roam clear with them. But you never really want to roam clear alone. Just push the side if your teammates are pushing there. Because not only one, does it make it to where you have a lower chance of actually winning because you're just one person against multiple people. But also if they have a caviera, you're running the risk of getting interrogated because you don't have a teammate for a refrag. You also aren't able to get multiple jobs done at once. You can't roam clear and play vert and den deny Valkyrie cameras or see if they're playing pulse. You can't do all of that. You can't be flank watch as well, right? There's just too many jobs that a roam clear requires for you to do it by yourself. So you're just kind of wasting your life if you try to roam clear by yourself instead of doing whatever your team is doing. Something else that you should not be doing on attack is staying on vert too long. What I see a lot of players doing is they'll do the roam clear, and then if there's 30 seconds left in the round, that's when they'll start playing vert. First of all, that is a mistake. At that point, just help your team hit the site. But more importantly, if you do end up getting the roam clear down and making vert within a timely manner, you don't want to be up there if there is exactly 45 seconds or less in the round. Because at that point, you need to be getting on site and getting the bomb down, or getting man count in your favor, or going for kills, whatever it may be. You don't need to be on vert for that long. And chances are, if you're on vert for that long, maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half, and you still haven't gotten kills, and you're still unable to apply pressure, that probably means that they're hiding somewhere, and they're not going to peek you. So your vert is completely useless anyways. So don't stay on vert too long stay on vert in the beginning to mid section of the round but in the end section of the round the last 45 seconds to 30 seconds of the round get off vert. there's no reason for you to be there if they're not peeking you then they're not going to peek you now just please help your team i see it way too often where i'm trying to get on the bomb and i have a ram upstairs holding an angle when we know the kid is literally right next to me you know what i mean just help your team in the last few seconds of the round and get off vert now this tip can play into my next tip which is adapting your pushes based off of man count so here is a great example. If I'm trying to get a wall open, but it is a 2v5 and I don't have my Thatcher anymore, maybe it's time to not get the wall open and it's time to push somewhere to maybe get some kills, a backside push, whatever it may be. If I'm trying to roam clear and my other roam clear duo dies, maybe adapt to push to somewhere else. Don't push there, right? Adapting when you're down in man count is very, very crucial, especially in the higher ranks, because if your teammates die somewhere, chances are they're there. So you're going to die there too, especially because like I said, 1vxs are harder to take than 2vxs, 3vxs, 4vxs, right? So adapt your pushes. If you see that there's a bunch of defenders somewhere and your team is dead, adapt accordingly. Not only should you be adapting in terms of your positioning, but you also should be adapting in terms of your aggression. If you're down a man count on attack, you want to either bait if they're being super aggressive, or you want to get aggressive if they're being super passive. Both of these will make it to where you're taking 1v1s instead of 1vxs, and you're going to get a lot more free kills this way, and kills that naturally wouldn't happen had you been more aggressive in the wrong spot or more passive in the wrong spot. If you know that they're swinging everything and that's how your team died, maybe sit outside and wait for them to run out on you and get the free kill and then go in. Or if you know they're playing super passive and your team just kind of ran in and died with an Amaru rush, then maybe get a bit more aggressive. Try to kill the roamers, try to kill the people on site, get on a rappel, do what you need to do to even the man count back up so that it is more in your favor or at least an even match instead of being something that is very disadvantageous, which is being down in man count. So you want to be adapting your pushes based off of your man count and based off of how your team is doing. 
Something else that you should adapt to doing mid-round is finding openings in the defense. There are many examples of this, but typically, because there's only five defenders, there's only so many places that they can roam, or sit, or anchor, whatever it may be. So if you notice, hey, they're all bunkering on site, that's when you'd want to take vert, or that's when you'd want to roam clear very, very quickly to get the amount of time that you need to play vert effectively. Or let's say they're all roaming, they have three to four roamers, only one guy on site, then rush the site, because a 4v1 is easier to take than a 1v4, right? So like, you're going to win that gunfight. So you want to adapt and find openings based off of what the defenders are doing in terms of their positioning. It goes deeper than this too. If you notice, hey, they have two guys in sight, two guys upstairs, and only one guy on the east side of the map, then maybe push the west side of the map because there's zero players there. So at least take that free space, right? The whole point of this tip is take free space. If you notice an opening that they're not holding, take it. Having space is always better than having not any space in the map because being able to sit in a room to safely drone to get utility down is going to be very very important instead of sitting outside and hoping that you don't get spawn peaked ran out on or just losing a gunfight so if you find an opening do not be afraid to take it and be more aggressive to actually net a free kill because a lot of the times openings include maybe they're not holding this part of the bomb site so you yourself by yourself can just run in the bomb site while two people are in the bomb site, but they're just looking the other way and they need a free kill, right? So try to find openings as much as possible onto people who don't even know you're there to take free map control. In order to correctly get map control, though, something that can help a lot is giving good comms. Now, the biggest tip about communication here that I want to give you is giving the actual call out in a proper manner. If I'm like, hey, there's a Malusi on the left in the green hallway, that's a bad call out. It is very specific, but if someone's in the middle of swinging, you want to get that call out fast so that they have the most amount of time to react and act off of that information. So instead of saying, hey, there's a Malusi standing over here, say in green hall standing, there is a Malusi because the first piece of information that your teammate needs to know is the exact position. They don't need to know the operator. They don't need to know what utility they have. They don't need to know if they're standing or crouched. They need to know where they are, first of all. So giving the location call out, then giving if they're standing, crouched, holding an angle, prone, swinging wide, whatever, then do that because it's more specific after they know the general area. Then maybe give the call out on the operator. If it's somebody like a mirror, so they know maybe not to swing the mirror. Or if it's somebody like a smoke, so they know maybe to play far away so they don't get shotgunned, right? You never want to give the operator name first and then the actual location of the call out last. You want to give the location of the call out first because I've died due to the fact that I'm mid swing and then someone calls it out but they called out the location last instead of the opposite where I've actually gotten saved because someone called out the location and then they called out the operator name and the other specifics like that. So making sure that you're giving call outs in an actual correct way can be the difference between you or your teammate losing a gunfight, which can be the difference between you winning or losing. Something else that can be the key difference between you winning or losing game can be actually filling based off of your team's needs on attack. So if you know that nobody's running anything for wall, nobody's running anything to help the person get wall, or maybe you're on a basement site and nobody's running anything for hatches or for vert, then you should be the one to fill those shoes. In a solo queue environment, you have the disadvantage of not being able to coordinate a good attack, but the least that you can do to make semi-coordination is to coordinate based off of your teammate's attack. So if you're attacking the basement of Oregon and you know we have an ash for the mirror we have a twitch for the mirror and the goyo we have a ying for the hatch drop we have maybe a shield operator or a zofia for utility explosives whatever it may be but nobody has anything for hatches then you would be the one to get something for the hatches not playing yana or finca because you like their gun it's much more important that you fill the roles that are necessary to have a dynamic and complicated and strategic attack that has many layers to it instead of just picking your favorite operator this is something called flexing. No, it's not the same as a flex operator role that we'll go over in a different video. But you want to be flexing your operator selection based off of your teammates if it's actually applicable in that scenario. For tip 15, I'm going to bring you back in game. The next mistake that I see players making is they push positions that are just way too hard to push alone. If you're a solo queue player, chances are you're alone. If I'm playing bank and I'm trying to attack alone, do not go to somewhere like square balcony. Because you have to worry about the heddles here, the staircase here the door down there for the flank you have to worry about the first stock window the second stock window anybody in stock you have to worry about the janitor door the janitor hall anybody with a shotgun close to this door like you just have to worry about way too much as one person it just doesn't make sense to push areas like this instead push places like lobby where you can drone yourself into atms drone out all of lobby have a cutoff camera for your flanks shoot the default camera and now you have all of this for free or maybe repel on that window as habana to get open the hallway walls right here or maybe go to open area and walk up the marble stairs for a fast rush either way do things that are better that you don't need a team for where you're not exposed to a number of different angles 
and it'll be a lot easier for you to attack on maps specifically that you don't really know how to attack on. Something else that I see a lot of attackers doing that is a mistake is using the wrong scopes in gunfights. Let's talk about Habana, who is somebody who has the 1x scope or the option of an ACOG in her loadout. If I'm trying to take square, having an ACOG here is great because I can see the railing, I can see into archives, I can see into like kitchen, anywhere, bottom square, it doesn't really matter. Having an ACOG here is really good. But then if I want to push down a staircase and swing a door really close to me, having an ACOG is terrible because it's way harder to take gunfights up close range with ACOGs because they're so zoomed in, especially ones like the ACOG B where you get barely any peripheral vision if you're on stretched res. Instead, use the actual hollow on your gun to take this close range gunfight. It's not as zoomed in, you'll be able to see people a lot more clearly, and it's much easier to take gunfights this way. So make sure that you're not using the wrong scope in the wrong distances when you're taking gunfights on attack, and you'll want a lot more of your gunfights this way. For the final tip number 17, the mistake you're making is you're swinging incorrectly. Whenever you're swinging, you want to prioritize certain angles first. If I'm swinging from the right, I want to prioritize the angles on the left first, and then I'll go slowly over like, okay, someone's on the window, nope, someone's on the couch, nope, someone's on this window, nope, someone's on that door, nope. Then I can worry about the kids on the right. Is someone on this table? Is someone on this rotate? Is someone close right prone with a shotgun? No? Okay, I'm good. You never want to check the kid on your right that's close first before checking all of these angles because you're exposing yourself to everybody on your left before you take the gunfight with the kid on your right. So if somebody really was on that window and somebody was on the rotate right here, I'd be able to take this gunfight one at a time and then take this gunfight. Whereas if I were to swing the kid on the right first and not even clear the left, I'd be taking gunfights two at a time. And like I said, a 1v1 is much easier than a 1v2. So make sure that you clear the left side if you're swinging from the right first, or clear the right side if you're swinging from the left first. Either way, just swing. Either way, clear the opposite of what you're swinging off of, and you should be fine. But with that out of the way, that is it for this video. Check out this next video. My name's Alka, and I hope we'll see you there. Later.